Hello, welcome to another Facebook Live with Flow Living. I am Elisa Vitti. I'm the founder of the Flow Living Hormone Center, and I am the creator of the Cycle Syncing Method. Um, I'm the best-selling author of Woman Code and the, fa uh, the founder of the MyFlow period tracking and cycle syncing app. And I come to you live every Thursday to talk about how to live uh, smarter and more healthfully inside your beautiful, unique female body. So hello and welcome. Hey, Amanda. Welcome, everybody. Today we're talking about anxiety and hormones and what you need to know about it and what you need to do about it obviously most importantly so as you're joining us obviously let me know where you're tuning in from because I love seeing how the flow sisterhood continues to grow worldwide um, but also let me know what your story is with anxiety and how that's affecting you these days. Thanks, Kayla. <laughs> um, Amanda, you're saying this is gonna be a great topic. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, I feel like everything that I, ta that I teach about, I, I um, have some e personal experience with. Hormonally, I'm a hormonally sensitive person, like probably a lot of you, so anxiety, um, was definitely a big part of my PCOS journey. Um, I, deal, I dealt with some anxiety postpartum, uh, so I, I know it well and know how to troubleshoot, biohack it, whatever the word is you wanna, you wanna use uh, for that. And I think it's an important thing to learn how to navigate. Oh my goodness, hi Fahima from Kenya. That is so cool, like I said. Flow Sisterhood is truly global, um, and I love, love, love knowing where you're tuning in from. That's so awesome. Welcome, Fahima. Um, Emily, you think you have PMDD. Why can't I see what the rest of your writing is? Ugh. I'm trying to open up your post, and it's just not letting me. Okay, so all I can see is that you get the most horrific PMS symptoms to the point where you feel and then I don't have to see any more, so type up, cut and paste the rest of that for me. Um, hi, Ayanis, you have PCOS, missing periods, among other things. Yeah, Ayanis, how was your, um, how's your mood with your PCOS? Do you notice that it's off? Do you feel anxious, depressed? Emily, you feel, that's a pretty strong thing to feel, Emily. Um, I would definitely want you to, you know, seek out some, some additional support, but I also want to teach you, um, you know, today what kinds of things might be going on so you can get some perspective on it and some strategies. Um, Ayanis, uh, but yeah, for, I mean, given, given how much of this, you know, uh, suicide has been in the media, I think it's really important if you are feeling that way to go and just talk to someone who specializes in that and can really support you so that you're not doing anything that's going to not be good. Um, so, okay, Ayanis, uh, you suffer depressed, you feel depressed and anxious. Um, Gabriella from Wisconsin, you just got your third recovery period after struggling with hypothalamic amenorrhea. That is so good. Congratulations. Uh, what was the key to getting your cycle back? Uh, hi, Jessica from Chicago. Kayla, I can't open your, I don't know what is happening. You have high testosterone, low estrogen, but you haven't been diagnosed with PCOS and you never miss a period. Hmm. Have you checked out your hypothalamus? Have you checked out your adrenals? Um, it'd be interesting to see if there's anything going on there. Emily, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, Kayla, you're saying your anxiety is an awful, it's just more short fused. Emily, you're on antidepressants and have been for eight years. Yeah. Emily, I, I want to direct you over to um, Kelly Brogan. Have you heard of Dr. Kelly Brogan? She's a psychiatrist who um, I think she's. MIT, 
um, she's super smart. She's a colleague of mine, and I, I know she has some specific programs called the Vital Mind program that uh, is specifically for women who are struggling with, you know, being on medication and still not feeling good. So since that's her area of expertise, I would love for you to check that out. You know, more resources is good. I'm happy to be a resource, but let's have more. More is more. Um, Jessica, you're so excited you caught me live. Hi, I'm so excited to have you here. Hi, Pia from Copenhagen, a place I have not yet been. I've been as far north as, as uh, Amsterdam. Bea from South Africa, Mary from Nigeria. Um, oh, Emily, see, I, have, I can't open up my comments. Um, Gabriella, oh yes, well, let's look at your, I can't open up your comments. It's been a journey, you cut out intense exercise, stopped running, ate more food. This is good, um, good. Yep, you had to lower the stress that you didn't know you had. Oh, good, Emily. I'm so glad you're going to look her up. It's good. Um, Tina, total anxi bad anxiety post-total hysterectomy. Much better with compounded bioidentical hormone, of course. Um, you're going to learn why that is. Um, yeah, Allison, I'm sorry to hear about your miscarriage. You know, there. I read something in the New York Times, actually, um, that I thought was really beautiful about the Japanese traditions and rituals around miscarriage. Um, look it up. It's New York Times Japanese miscarriage ritual. Uh, just Google that and this article will come up and it, it just, um, I think it's worth a read when you're going through it because you can um, do a ritual like this or something of your own interpretation that's like this to heal uh, from the, the traumatic grief of losing a loved one and then create some emotional space for you to have other feelings at the same time. So I think it's important. Ritual can help us emotionally and psychologically process and integrate experiences that are difficult. Um, and miscarriage is a difficult experience. Um, so just want to support you in that. Um, Hey Petra from the Netherlands, you missed your period when you were a teenager due to anorexia and now, and then I can't see the rest of that. Oh Anna, thank you, I love you too. Um, I love doing these lives because it's just like a big party with all my friends talking about my favorite topics, which is everything hormones <laughs> and food. So thank you for joining me. It's really one of my weekly highlights. Um, Jessica, off birth control, your anxiety has been a lot worse. Totally, totally, totally. We're going to talk about that. Um, and we'll talk about that too. Hey, Marianne from Scotland. You f experience a bit of anxiety and tension during ovulation. That is so interesting. We'll talk about that too. Or you take, you have bad anxiety when you don't take your vitamins. Yep. Hey, Kayla, Kayla from LA. Um, so cool, our panic from Armenia, currently Atlanta, bad anxiety since change of birth control balance. Rachel, your book changed my life. Oh, I'm so glad. I love, I love that. Um, write us, would you write a review on Amazon for me? That would make me so happy. <laughs> I would love to, I always go in and read them. So it's nice to hear how it changed your life. You can tell me the whole story there. I will be reading it. Um, Yes, Christiana, you feel so crazy the week before your period. Your emotions are all over the place. Um, hey, Kendi, from my favorite. Honestly, you have the favorite. Like, I just love saying the name of your town, Rancho Cucamonga. Like, I just feel like that's something I would say to my kid when she's being crazy, like you're being Cucamonga. <laughs> so thanks for being here. I always like seeing your city <laughs> represented. Um, hey, Sonia from Houston. Okay. I think I've caught up with everybody's comments, but um, <laughs> I do say silly things to her all the time, so it, don't put it past me. I might say it to her later. Um, so I'm so glad we're all here talking about anxiety because everybody's anxious and not things are not working. Um, oh, that's awesome, Stephanie. You are reading my book now. And using Woman Code as a resource, that's awesome. Jen, you are re recommending my book to your clients too. That is so great. I love that. I love that. Someday I'll 
do something more formal as a training for health coaches. I would love to support more of everyone's work. Um, so <clears throat> let's talk about what I want to teach you today. Um, you know, our hormones and our moods are inextricably linked. I think a lot of you are already intuitively feeling that. You, you notice that there are cyclical patterns with your hormones. Um, you notice that there are certain times of the month where things are more intense. And, you know, I suppose that um, the conditioning that we receive simply says, well, that's just how it is. You're PMSing, you're crazy, you're moody, expect it and then take no action. And that's what's so toxic about, you know, if I had to sort of sum up all the period mythology that is an active form of oppression in your life as a woman, it is really just summed up as that. You're cursed with periods, bad periods, you're going to be um, suffering nothing can be done they'll never get any better and so you take no action to improve yourself and and this i mean and let's let's just do some accounting right is it just anxiety right so you've got anxiety that might kind of make you feel off for a week or two then you have other pms symptoms maybe you get migraines maybe you have bloating maybe you have uh, acne maybe you have bad cramps you know what, how much time do you have in your life where you're feeling good, clear, focused, on it, energized, in a good mood to go out and bring your gifts to the world, to be in loving service to whatever cause or project or creative expression is meaningful to you? I'm, I'm asking. How much time do you have in your body where you're feeling like a champion? I'd love some answers. <laughs> uh, this is not just a rhetorical question because this conditioning about how you're supposed to feel bad really holds you back in your life because you're conditioned this way, you don't take any action and then you're, you're not feeling good. A lot of you are saying very rarely do you feel like a champion. So how are you supposed to, it's like a perfect, it's like the most, if somebody had to mastermind, how do we take out 50% of the population? How do we just totally keep them out of the game? Well, let's make them believe that they just got the short end of the stick from a biological point of view and that they shouldn't expect better for themselves. And then um, they won't do anything. <laughs> Drives me nuts. So obviously um, I am very passionate about making sure you understand because the only difference between how you feel now and you feeling like a champion and whatever that means to you, just feeling good in your body and feeling like you can go just do what you want to do, unencumbered by symptoms that bring you down. Uh, the only thing that's holding you back from that is information, and that's what I want you to have. So let's get to it. Um, okay, <clears throat> I think that you know I'll I'll start with obviously the cycle itself, <clears throat> and you know what's important to understand about moods and your cycle. So th there are real neurochemical effects um, that impact our mood based on the fluctuating levels of hormones. I, I've talked about this in Woman Code, it's outlined in the MyFlow app, I'll just recap it here if this is the first time you're hearing about it. So just the whole premise of cycle thinking, the method that I created is this idea that, you know, we are being told another insidious oppressive conversation that we get is that you know you're the same you're supposed to be the same every single day so you have a 24-hour circadian clock and you just have to like rinse and repeat you eat this you know if you eat the same food every day you should feel the same if you work out the same every day you should feel good you should lose weight you should all these things none of that's actually happening, right? Like PS, it's, like, it's not really working. And the reason why it's not really working is because um, you have two clocks. You have the 24 hour clock and then you have your 28 day clock and you have these two clocks. 
and they both need to be accounted for and dealt with and supported. So in the 28 day clock, how that affects your mood, you know, when estrogen is surging, estrogen is a, um, a social hormone, if you will. It promotes um, a, uh, a buoyant mood, right? It's, it's pro, um, it, it doesn't have any dampening effects on serotonin or dopamine, right? It's, it just helps you feel good. When you go into the second half of your cycle, you should still feel good, but there are certain complications that can arise if your hormones are imbalanced. So if, for example, um, you go into the second half of your cycle and everything's balanced, right? All that, the, all that you're gonna notice is that you're less interested in being social. That's all, but you're still in a good mood. You're more interested on doing things for yourself. You're more interested in doing things that need to get done. You're more interested in taking care of your, your, your interior life, whether that be inside of your home, inside of your body, inside of your thoughts. That's all that the shift should be when hormones are balanced. When they're not, you all know how it feels, right? You feel anxious, you can feel depressed, you can feel both, you can feel irritable, you can feel really extreme, crying fits. I mean, I've been there, I understand it well. Um, in fact, just in case you th think that I'm like, always hormonally perfect. I am I am living the practice just like you. So so I got thrown a really big curveball, uh, really big, and, and this is why I wanted to talk about anxiety this month, because I, I got to experience it in my luteal phase uh, two weeks ago in a way that I hadn't for a long time. And I was like, whoa, this sucks. <laughs> so here's what happened. So first day of school for my daughter, first day of a new school of pre-K, um, c commuting to a, a new location for school, bigger, you know, the whole thing. I did the drop off and um, I was on my way back and I got a, a call from my husband and he was being rushed to the emergency room. It's a long story, he's fine. But for that whole first week of school, he was sick. I was tending to him, you know, night and day. I was doing drop off and pick up at school, which, you know, when you don't live in suburbia, it's like an hour because you got to take the subway and then you can come back and the schlepping the stroller and it's a whole, you know, it's like a workout. <laughs> and our babysitter was out sick and she's been out sick. It's now her fourth week. And so she's on the mend as well, but she won't be coming back till next week. So I had no after school care and I run my company and the whole thing. And I was feeling it people i was definitely stressed i was worried about my husband i was doing all the schlepping i was you know i was unexpectedly having to reduce my work hours in a way that i wasn't planning there's a lot going on always at flow living and i really really was feeling stressed to the point where during my ovulation phase i felt super bloated and i was like whoa what's going on you know and i doing all my good eating and sleeping and supplements and I was still, the, the impact of this amount of stress was a little too much for me to handle. Got all bloated, then the luteal phase was real intense, emotionally very like anxious and then I would like have crying fits and I was like so upset at my husband for no reason. I was like, ah, <laughs> it was not fun. Um, and then when my period started, as I had expected, the first day was brown, not red. Now, what do we know from, from that, right? I always love using myself as a case study. It was brown, right? Low progesterone. So why, what happened? And I wanted to break this down so that you could see what could happen to any woman, you know, at any time, right? So here's what happened. Cortisol levels, the adrenaline from that first week of the school starting and him being super sick in the hospital and the whole thing, that was a lot of adrenaline, much more than I normally am called to put out. So my cortisol levels were being used up too much, right? Too much cortisol was being called in to bring down that adrenaline. And then when it ran out, right, of when, you know, not enough cortisol to counter affect all the stress, it started stealing my progesterone levels. 
And it does that because progesterone is molecularly similar to cortisol. So when your body is running low on cortisol to deal with your stress, it steals from your progesterone. And this is significant, not just because it's gonna give you like the brown color in your period, but because it's gonna really, really set you up for that PMS anxiety, depression situation. Um, you know, and, and it does that for a couple reasons. One, because without enough progesterone, you start to feel, you know, fatigued and moody and all of that. But also um, because you're also not going to necessarily have enough GABA. And depending on your body's predisposition for um, when you don't have enough GABA, right, you may start burning through your serotonin more quickly, and so there is where the anxiety comes from, right? So you can feel really like edgy. Everything becomes an overwhelming, bad situation. You feel very, I remember feeling just like negative about everything. I was literally saying to my friend, I was like, I am so sick of hearing myself feeling critical of all these situations <laughs> because I know this is just my hormones, but I can't. You know, it's just this is how I'm feeling. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's that's the power of um, of you know stress in terms of setting you up for that cycle. And it's so important because if you are doing too much, if you don't have enough self care in the first half of your cycle, or at the end, this is why when we do cycle thinking, it's so important to give yourself that. Um, self-care at the end of the cycle because your body starts making progesterone remember um, right as the egg is released right your all these hormones start shifting so that the corpus luteum the sac from where the egg is released starts building up progesterone for the next cycle and if you if you burn through that because you have all this stress that you're not managing properly. And so that's one kind of stress that I'm describing. I'm gonna describe a few others. One kind of stress is like situational stress that I really didn't have any control over and I did my very best. I think it could have been much worse, um, my physical reaction, <laughs> you know, and you know, I, I know what to do to recover. But I think that if you have months and months of this where it just, there's no end, you're gonna find yourself in a situation where you think something is psychologically wrong with you when in fact you really just burning through your cortisol, burning through your progesterone, burning through your GABA, and you're gonna feel really, really, really unwell. Um, <clears throat> So I think that it's important. Stephanie's saying, yes, that's you, not enough self-care, too much work and stress. Um, so, so I need you to kind of evaluate, you know, are you in a situation where there's kind of a lot of situational stress? The second thing is interior stress, right, where you're not getting enough supplementation, you're not eating right, you're not doing enough exercise or too much, you're not sleeping enough. Um, all of that is a form of stress in itself that causes imbalances in blood sugar, in thyroid, in adrenals, that will definitely result in a misfiring of estrogen and progesterone, which will contribute to negative moods. So that's, a, that's sort of internal stress, and that you can do a lot with. That's why I said it could, be, it could have been so much worse um, how, I, how my body reacted because at least I had that going for me. And then the third thing, which <clears throat> this whole experience um, brought to the front and center for me, is that outside of taking physical care of yourself, we do need some form of stress management, whether that's meditation or something. And I talk about it all the time. I have various practices, a lot of which I couldn't do because I was so busy being like super, super mom, single mom in a way um, while everybody was out for the count. Um, it was harder for me to, you know, do things socially to, to tend and befriend and to decompress from stress. And I thought, gee, I need to maybe turn up the volume on a practice that I can do regardless of what's going on to get centered in my breathing, to connect to you know something greater than myself, to kind of have like a, a more grounded 
place to stand solidly on when the vicissitudes of life are trying to like knock me off my center. So I'm still figuring out what it is that I'm gonna do. But for those of you who have a meditation practice, great. You know, if you have something that you can always go to to find your center, um, that, that I think is gonna be something that you wanna think about adding in because the reality is stress happens, life happens, things get crazy. And if you have a history of being someone who's susceptible, like I do, because when I was first going through my PCOS, the anxiety, the depression was overwhelming. I couldn't, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. I couldn't, I, it was ridiculous. Um, so if you have a history of that, you know, you're, you're a little bit more susceptible, you're more vulnerable to having these vicissitudes of life kind of knock you off center. And know that about yourself, accept that about yourself, love love that about it's like you know that's just what it is you have to love that you have to accept it and embrace it and find ways to strategize right oh people are typing some cool ideas um uh here we go grace having a baby is messed with you i uh, yenis you pray to god that is beautiful it, you know in fact i just came across the work of um what's his name eben Alexander, he wrote, he's a neurosurgeon who wrote a book called Proof of Heaven. I haven't read his book yet, but I watched him do a presentation on um, uh, his experience and all of that. And actually, deep, evidently, deep prayer is the same as deep meditation and evidently is, has, he has a lot of interesting things to say about it. I'm just, just learning so I can't really make any intelligent commentary to you but if you're curious about that there's more to be learned for sure um, some people like Kayla long distance running you know some physical certainly physical activity absolutely flushes cortisol I've talked extensively about how orgasm clitoral orgasm is like the best way to flush cortisol jumping on a mini trampoline flushes cortisol so there's a lot of things you can do with your body but I also was just thinking, in because I am just wrapping up my bleed now, and I was in my intuitive, reflective, right and left hemisphere week, I was like, yeah, I think maybe, maybe it's time for me to have some centering practice every day so that I feel a little bit beyond just my physical practice of moving my body and taking care of it with food. I'm thinking about what I can add to it because this September really, um, really made me want to think about it differently. So anyway, <laughs> that's, that was my September. Is it over yet? <laughs> my cycle is getting started again, so I feel like a, a new energy is upon me, even though the month is, we're only really halfway through the month. So that, um, that is a really, really important um, piece of the story. I think it's one of the main pieces of where a vast majority of you are having an anxiety reaction is this cortisol, progesterone, GABA misfiring. And um, if you think that that's going on, if you have symptoms of low progesterone in your luteal phase with a lot of PMS and anxiety, if you have brown staining at the start of your cycle or anywhere through your bleed, um, chances are pretty high that you have some low progesterone. Um, someone asked a question about what is GABA? It's a chemical. So it's a chemical produced in the brain, <clears throat> and it. Um, one of the things that it does is it regulates how quickly your brain will use serotonin. So if you don't have enough, you're gonna use your serotonin faster. And when you run out of serotonin, you don't. You feel more anxious. You feel not good. So that's that's what GABA does. It kind of controls the pacing of that. Um, so, yes, Inga, that's what he's, yes, I know, I, 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 when Eben Alexander said that, um, about what he learned, I thought that was really beautiful too. Um, you know, we are, uh, so Carly, what do you do to boost progesterone flow? I'm going to get to that. I just want to keep going through some of the, these root causes of anxiety. Um, I want to talk about another one that was really, you know, as I always do these research for the blogs, I'm always looking for something new. Um, heavy bleeding, there was a study done on heavy bleeding leads to anemia, right? Leads to anxiety. So if you have heavy, heavy bleeding, there was this study done, um, so estrogen dominance, too much estrogen, um, and the, I just want to make sure, 
Uh, yeah, anxiety is a symptom of anemia. So if someone, if you're saying, well, gee, I don't seem to have the brown staining and I don't really have, um, you know, a lot of stress and I don't understand why I'm anxious, check your flow. If your flow is really, really heavy, then you might be having some mild anemia that is creating an anxiety response in your brain. So I think it is so, so, I mean, in either situation, right, where your period might be sluggish to start with a low progesterone, that has a whole neurochemical effect that can create anxiety. If it's too heavy and you have, like, it starts red and you're bleeding through things, that can cause anxiety. So always this, in, there's an absolute link between, um, your period and your moods. And I think it's it's not one that you should just settle for, um, but one you should understand what is the cause so that you can do something about it. Because for example, if you have the heavy flow, you don't need to do the progesterone stuff necessarily, although some of that will help because you want to counter affect that um, excess estrogen, but you might want to do more estrogen flushing and elimination with foods, but you also might want to do things to boost your um, you know, iron, right? Just to triage that mood des destabilization. So it's really, I find this so fascinating how you can biohack your cycle in different ways. Now, another key mood destabilizer, another one that's near and dear to my heart um, is, oh, Lauren, you feel anxiety on your heavy flow days. That's why. So on your heavy flow days, you know, you could do things like eating beets, you could take some chlorophyll, you could eat some sea vegetables, you could have a steak, have a steak, see how you feel. Um, for those of you with the heavy flow, uh, of course it has to be grass-fed, organic, antibiotic-free, free-range steak. It's so crazy how many things we have to worry about. Why are we polluting our food and our environment? This makes no sense. Then everybody has to worry about where's the food coming from. Let's just have cleanly produced food and then we could just eat whatever we need. Anyway, this is why I want more women working on solving these bigger problems, you know? Bigger problems than do I fit into my genes. Um, I think you have, as, as we as, a, as half of the population could do so much to turn the ship around ecologically and environmentally in ways that we need as a species now and our children and their children need in the future. Um, Holly's saying, oh my God, that's why you crave steak on your cycle. Eat the steak, Holly, okay? And then I want you to notice, does your, how does your anxiety improve? I mean, if you need to eat steak every day until you figure out how to get your anemia resolved and your progesterone up and your estrogen down, eat steak during your bleed every day, have a little bit, have three ounces every day. You don't need to like have a porterhouse, whatever, <laughs> you don't have to have like a whole dinner plate of steak, but have like three to four ounces. Um, um, Stephanie, you're here for that. Awesome. Totally. Uh, Bethany, you crave so much fat during your luteal phase. Great. You're probably really low in omega-3 fatty acids. Last night I had a major craving for dairy. I don't eat dairy. This is a problem. <laughs> I was, cr I, 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 I recognized this craving. It's like a specific, I had it during my pregnancy. I was like, I need calcium. I had no calcium in the house that I could take supplementally. So I, t I had some goat cheese, a, a raw manchego goat, aged goat cheese, and I was fine. And it totally fixed what I needed to fix. And I feel fantastic today, actually. My, I noticed my under eye circles were totally fine. My energy was good. So sometimes you have to do the craving. Liver, oh, Trinity, thank you for bringing up liver. It reminds me I have to get some to make my daughter this week. <laughs> I try to feed her liver once a week. Um, liver during your menstrual cycle, so, so good. But yes, omega-3 fatty acids, if you need to eat fat, eat it. Whatever you're craving, good. Trinity and Lauren, make sure when you're buying liver that it is coming from an organically fed, grass-fed animal. Because remember, the liver is the clearinghouse of toxins. And if you're gonna do beef, it's better to do, even though this, you know, it's not nice, it's, you know, veal, because it's the, 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 the animal is young enough where it's not 
processing a lot of toxins if that's something that you can even get access to. I don't even know if they sell that anymore. Um, otherwise, you can do chicken, chicken liver um, as well, organic chickens. That's a good way to do it. Lisa Marie, the reason that you crave sweets on your luteal phase is because your body is trying to make a lot of progesterone for the next cycle and it requires B vitamins. And if you don't eat enough carbohydrates, and also because you have major more calorie needs during the second half of the cycle than you do during the first half. So if you don't give yourself enough uh, slow burning carbohydrates, you're gonna go to sugar because your brain is gonna tell your body to get whatever carbs you need. Um, <clears throat> So, so, so important to look at those things. Okay, third cause. We've talked about two causes why you might have anxiety and, uh, tied to your cycle, because a lot of you in the beginning, we were talking about how your anxiety feels like it has a cyclical pattern. Well, there's a reason. If it's too heavy of your flow, you could be having anemia, uh, anxiety-related anemia. If you're <clears throat> low on progesterone um, and your stress levels are high, then it creates a whole progesterone GABA situation. Um, the third reason that you could have anxiety is insulin imbalances, right? Insulin is a hormone. We don't think of it because it's not a sex hormone, but it absolutely affects your sex hormones dramatically. It's the first step of the flow protocol. It is so critical stabilizing your um, blood sugar levels <clears throat> that if you don't do this right, you could have not only all the anxiety and all of that, but you can stop ovulation, you can dampen your fertility, your sex drive, your mood, I mean, it, you can create a mess from an endocrine point of view by not getting your blood sugar stable. It is the most important thing that your endocrine system is concerned about, keeping enough glucose circulating to the brain, the heart, and the muscle tissue. That is the focus of the endocrine system, in fact. That's its most important job. If you don't support that every meal of the day and keep your blood sugar nice and stable, you are gonna feel it in your cycle. So um, your mood can go out of balance very quickly, right? So for example, how many of you have had the experience where you skip a meal? Here's it, here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a story about my daughter. This may not make me look like the best mom, but <laughs> it was a learning lesson, okay? So, so on one of these first few weeks, my daughter's obviously been having a little bit of transition anxiety going to school for a longer period of time. Last year, she was only in school from 9 to 12. She'd come home for lunch. She was here the whole day. Now she's in school till 3. She's like, it's such a long day. Last week, she was crying at, you know, at school, going to school. It was very stressful. So one of the afternoons, she's like, can we just cuddle? on the couch and I was like, well, I should make dinner. She's like, no, 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 let's just cuddle. So I was trying to like boost her spirits. We were cuddling and the whole thing. And then I started, my blood sugar started dropping and I was like, okay, our, I gotta get in the kitchen. And then she just came over a few minutes later. I was trying to cook something really quickly and I was definitely in a, starting to get in the kind of like a bad mood. She's just, she's like, she was crying kind of softly. She's like, I don't know why I'm crying. I'm like, cause you're hungry, your blood sugar's dropping. I'm, I was like saying to myself, I'm the worst mom ever. <laughs> you know, I should have cuddled with you less and cooked sooner. Um, so that experience that happened to my daughter happens to you, but as an adult, you're more desensitized to it and your dr lowered blood sugar, right, is causing major distress to your brain, your heart, your muscle, your whole body is now on orange alert. We don't have enough glucose, need food now, need sugar now, whatever kind of food we can get, we're gonna eat it. And that low blood sugar is very mood destabilizing because for a reason, it wants you to do something, it wants you to feed yourself so that you don't create a big problem. Um, so um, it's really important to eat in a, in a blood sugar stabilizing way. For those of us, uh, for those of you who are struggling with insulin sensitivity where your body is inefficient at using insulin and getting glucose into the cell, you're even more susceptible to anxiety uh, related to blood sugar imbalances. So it's really, really important to think about how you can improve this situation. Um, uh, Alam, you're asking, what if you're on the pill continuously? Ay, ay, ay. I want you to watch one of my um, Facebook live videos about um, the 
complications from synthetic birth control. I call synthetic birth control syndrome. So I want you to look at that. You can't distinguish the phases uh, and you're in a perpetual sort of very strange luteal phase. So it's not good. Um, okay. Ooh, Ruth, I like your idea for stress management. You've been telling yourself every day that you approve of yourself. That is beautiful. Good for you. Um, <laughs> Bethany said, yikes, get off that train, girl. Yeah, Alam, you might want to, um, yeah, many, many endometriosis women are on the pill continuously. Yeah, I'd love for you to check out some of our resources about endometriosis and why uh, birth control um, is not a solution for it and what other options you have. Um, so let's talk about, oh my gosh, it's almost two o'clock. We got to talk about some solutions. Um, okay. Let's, let's dive in. Um, and this is uh, interesting how many people are struggling with anxiety. I'll do more because you guys are asking some great questions about supporting GABA and tryptophan foods and I'll do some more things. But let me share with you what I have. Um, so first thing, the first most important thing you can do to stabilize your mood is to stabilize your blood sugar. If I haven't made that obvious by now, Please read Woman Code. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think it's so important. Eating the right carbs at the right time. I know it's so controversial these days to talk about carbohydrates, but women actually need carbohydrates. Did you know that I'm working on my next book? I have a second book coming. <laughs> I'm almost done with the manuscript. It's crazy. Um, did you know that the vast majority of dietary research is done on men? and postmenopausal women. This is really important because any information that you've received in the media about how intermittent fasting is good for everyone, coffee is good for everyone, um, not having any carbohydrates is good for everyone. Guess what that research is based on? Men and postmenopausal women. And then it is being set, uh, suggested that it is universally applicable to you in your reproductive cycling years with your second 28 day clock. Does that make any sense to you? Is that good science? Is that reasonable as an assumption? It is not. <sighs> so carbohydrates, they are valuable in your diet, not to be feared. I know, Karina, it is crazy. Why don't they do it? Because researchers, the male researchers historically have been too um, scared by the fluctuating uh, cyclical patterns and they feel that they can't control for the experiment. But you can control for the experiment within the cycle as long as you know which phase of the cycle you're in and you adjust the experiment. It just needs to be something that changes cyclically. It's just, it's just laziness, I think. I, I, mean, I have no other good explanation for you as to why this would be happening. It's a little combination of um, not, not having some thoughtful, it's, it's three things. It's misogyny, right? It's part of that conversation we talked about in the beginning about, you know, this conditioning that you're just, you're just getting the short end of the biological stick. Um, it's the fact that up until recently, all the research was being done by men because women weren't allowed into that field. Uh, you know, you got to keep in mind, women were only allowed into college and medical school in the sixties. So it's just been kind of recent that women are spearheading research departments, getting grants, etc. And then third, I don't think enough people have put together a thoughtful protocol on how you would do a, um, research during a cyclical um, experience. And, but of course it could be done. I mean, think of what is being done. Rocket ships to the moon, laparoscopic surgery. I mean, anything is possible. So it's just nonsense that it's not being done. So I share this with you because I think it's important that you now, now that you've heard it from me, take with a huge grain of salt whenever you see something in the media that's like, oh, this is now, this new study says that coffee is good for everybody or uh, coffee prevents Alzheimer's and carbs is gonna give you dementia. And it's like, well, yeah, maybe we're talking about half the population. 
But for you, you need carbohydrates to stabilize your blood sugar. You don't need a lot, and you need the right kind, and you certainly need more in the second half of your cycle, but you need them, and you shouldn't be afraid of them. And so, you know, check out the MyFlow app to help you understand and navigate that. And of course, Chapter 5 in Woman Code breaks down the food chart phase by phase so you know which to eat when. Um, and of course, if any of you haven't heard about, it's kind of been kind of quiet. We just beta launched it in July, um, but we're about to open the doors, I think, on, over the weekend. Um, uh, we have a, a very private cycle syncing membership. So if you want to come and really dial in your cyclical eating and exercise and lifestyle so that you can get that really anchored in your life, you should um, email support at Flow Living, see if you can get on the wait list to when the doors open this weekend. I would love to have any of you who are interested in doing that with me more. Um, okay, so stabilize your blood sugar, you know, eat carbs, make sure you're eating a breakfast that you can, that keeps you stable, right? So for example, <clears throat> this morning I had a very, solid breakfast because I was running around, I had to go get my hair done because I have an event tomorrow morning right after school drop off. So I was like, let me get my hair done today. And then I, and then I ran back to do Facebook Live. I literally got here um, 20 minutes before I came on the air. I haven't eaten lunch yet. I'm gonna eat lunch as soon as I'm done, but I am good because I had a really substantial breakfast knowing that I needed to kind of push things today, right? So, so important to get a breakfast down that works for you. And in the monthly flow program, we spend a whole month trying to figure out which, which combinations of macronutrients, carbs, fats, proteins, et cetera, is gonna keep you blood sugar stable. So, so important. Um, another thing that's gonna help you with your anxiety um, is really f getting your, yeah, you don't have to eat gluten, um, to have carbs, I mean, legumes are carbs, sweet potatoes are carbs, you know, there's oatmeal is carbs, there's a lot of gluten, -free. I mean, I've been gluten free for 20 years, I, so much, so much you can eat that's gluten free. Um, dialing in your exercise cyclically is also really important because of that cortisol, progesterone, GABA conversation. If you work out, if you do high intensity interval training, second half of your cycle, you're going to push your cortisol to a point where it starts to steal that progesterone and you're gonna to start to feel anxiety again more. So if you're struggling with anxiety, I would very much have you just, just this month, as soon as you're done with ovulation, get out of all high intensity interval exercise. Just do Pilates, do core work, take walks, do yoga. Don't do anything where you're jumping up and down cardio, running, and I, it will be night and day for you about your mood um, during the luteal phase. And it, so really work on that. It's just such a simple thing you can do without taking more supplements or adding in special things. Sometimes the best place to start when you're dealing with anxiety is switching up these basic things that have this massive impact on your cyclical hormones. You feel so much better. Blood insulin being one and getting that cortisol with supporting your cortisol levels with exercise for the right phase of your cycle, so huge. Okay, <clears throat> cut out coffee. I know, I know a lot of you struggle with that. Um, however, <clears throat> um, the, the way that coffee impacts your cortisol and your blood sugar is significant, and if you are struggling with anxiety, it's gonna make it worse. And then I would also recommend that you read that article I did on five re things women should know before they take another sip of coffee. It's on the Flow Living blog. If you are one of the 50% of the population, 50% of the population do not metabolize caffeine well of any sort. And when you can't break down caffeine, it actually can give you an anxiety attack-like response depending on how bad your metabolism is. Um, mine is really bad and I will have like palpitations and I will feel um, really, really bad. So I really am sorry to tell you 
But this caffeine thing, very applicable for men, very applicable for postmenopausal women. But if you are one of the 50% of the population that has this inability to metabolize caffeine, it is definitely making you more anxious. Um, Lauren, yep, read Lauren's post. Don't take my word for it. You don't even have to read the research, but Lauren is talking about, yeah, Ginny, if the tea is caffeinated, it's caffeine. It, it's, I'm saying coffee, but I'm just really what I mean is caffeine. Um, caffeine, 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 anxiety, anxiety, anxiety. Sorry, okay, or right, moving on. <laughs> okay, um, the pill. Consider getting off whatever birth control you're on. If it's hormone, if it's hormone releasing, uh, whether it's the ring or the implant, um, et cetera, or oral, uh, there is absolutely um, research now that has come out about how these synthetic hormones increase mood destabilization, anxiety and depression. So if you're struggling with this and you're on synthetic birth control, you might wanna think about getting off of it. <clears throat> Do not go off of it cold turkey. Get on the balance supplements, which you can get at flowliving.com and start cycle syncing your food and then when you do give yourself like one to two months depending on how long you've been on the pill and then you can go off without having major you know tr transition stress of going from synthetic hormones to trying to produce your own what do i recommend for birth control tanya i recommend barrier methods multiple barrier methods during ovulation. When you know you're ovulating, use a diaphragm or a sponge and condoms if you're with a male partner. Um, and then when you're not in your fertile window, you can just use condoms. Um, or the diaphragm if you're married or in a long-term relationship, if that's what you wanna do. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, Morena, Lindsay, You've had it for two years, it's brought on so much anxiety. Yes, Mirena is a ring. Uh, no, Mirena is the IUD that secretes hormones. So yeah, anything that's secreting hormones, whether it's a birth control pill, a Mirena IUD, the Nuva ring, the uh, implant, any of that, um, any of those birth control forms that secrete hormones are going to destabilize your mood. and. In my practice, almost 20 years of practice, getting women to switch away from that synthetic hormone and really support producing their own, their anxiety goes away. So good. Okay, last thing, boost progesterone naturally. Um, you don't want to get to um, a place where you need to take bioidentical hormones necessarily. Um, you want to try to do what you can to support your own progesterone production. Progesterone is made from pregnenolone. It's a master compound that uh, other hormones are derived from. And that is, pregnenolone is derived from cholesterol. So if you want to have enough hormones, you have to have enough fats to make and carbohydrates to make cholesterol in the body. A lot of women are really low in cholesterol. Um, because of diet fads that have nothing to do with their well-being in mind that are really great for men. And, um, and this is relevant for Kendra's postpartum anxiety, which I went through some of that too. You've got to, and yes, PCOS is all applicable, whether you have PCOS or postpartum, um, is really, really important to understand that you've got to increase healthy fat in your diet. Fats are your friend if you are in your reproductive years. To keep your hormones stable, you need healthy fats. So think about avocados, olives, um, nuts, seeds, oily fish. We have a whole article on seed cycling, how you can use a combination of flax, pumpkin, sesame uh, seeds to boost the right fats to help you make progesterone. You can look that up. Um, on the blog as well. Those things can really help you boost progesterone, um, especially as you're dealing with a lot of stress. And then I would definitely say, you know, f as we talked about earlier, find some ways to manage your stress. Don't add any more stress to your life by not getting um, the, the food and exercise piece right, but you know, for the times that just life is stressful from time to time, 
see if you can find a centering practice like meditation that can just help keep you grounded so you don't feel so tossed about in the waves of things that happen during the day. I think that's um, an increasingly important tool for us to use as we live in this hyper time, you know, hyper technological time. It has an impact on what we expect out of ourselves, which is not human. It's uh, uh, you know technologically based. So those are some of the things that I wanted to share with you today. So today we talked about you know hormone-driven anxiety, what, it, what it's caused by, how it's tied to the cycle, and what are some really deep biohacks to fix it, right? Because I didn't want to give you like a bunch of surface stuff like how to make more GABA, how to, what are the tryptophan foods to make more you know, neurotransmitters. Those are not going to serve you. That's like putting a Band-Aid on a cut, right? I want you to stop having the wound open up and so to go really deep, we had to look at um, you know, how to stabilize insulin, how to um, reduce um, the stress that comes from you know, forcing cortisol to be depleted, which is over exercising in the wrong phase of the cycle, caffeine, um, and then birth control pills if, or any synthetic birth control, if that's a factor for you and then ways to boost progesterone with foods so that you don't have to go to bioidentical hormone sources. So if you just pick one of these things to try, I gave you like seven different things to do. If you pick one of them, you're gonna to start to feel a difference. And that's all I want you to do, take one action. Remember, society has conditioned you to take no action. That's how it wants to keep us all in the jar, right? You heard of the story of the grasshopper in the jar. <clears throat> You put a grasshopper in a jar, you put the lid on, the grasshopper bounces, hits the top of the lid, and then realizes, oh, I'm only gonna bounce half as high. Then you could take the lid off, that grasshopper is never gonna jump out of that jar unless you turn it over and let it out. Don't let the conditioning of our culture, our misogynistic culture, keep you from taking action. Um, Take one action, do one experiment out of the seven that I gave you and see what results you can generate in one cycle and then add another one. You can get rid of your anxiety in a few cycles if you really commit to it, absolutely, and you can do that naturally. You can feel like you're supposed to feel. So I just want to encourage you to take action. <clears throat> you know, if you want to fight the patriarchy, fix your period. <laughs> Start there and then you'll be able to do other things. So um, anyway, I love, love, loved our conversation today and all of your questions and all of your comments. And I love spending this hour with you every week. So I'll be looking forward to doing it again next week. Invite some of your friends. Um, I hope I've inspired you to take some one action to deal with your anxiety. Um, you can do it. There's no reason to be a victim to this mythology that says you should suffer. It is nonsense. Um, thank you guys for joining me and I will see you next week with another, another juicy topic on how to live healthier in an, the majestic, marvelous, powerful female body. See you next time.